Blake's. Like, hey, Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> like, we need to get this puppy started. Yeah, okay. Nikki Blake, take it away, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> On today's episode of the Scooby Panel, Nikki and Wendy meet storyboard artist, layout artist, producer, and director Charles Grosvenor. You worked on a few Scooby things. You worked on the new Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show and the Richie Rich Scooby-Doo show and Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue. Can you walk us through how you started in your career as an artist? Well, I, since I was a very young boy, I loved to draw and I drew all the time. And as I got a little bit older, about seven, eight or nine years old, um, I determined that what I really loved was drawing for newspapers um, or the people who were at that point drawing in newspapers, the comic strips. And But my favorite were sports cartoons. Our local paper in New Jersey had uh, Charlie McGill doing them. And in New York, there was a fellow named Willard Mullen, who may have been the best of all of them. And so I patterned myself after those two. And later on, Charlie McGill became kind of a mentor for me. I went down to the Hackensack uh, Bergen record and had him teach me different tricks about the trade. Um, so that went on through, through high school time. And then two things happened. One, I encountered a um, very dynamic biology teacher and he made just biology come alive. And, and there were many of us who were just fascinated by the world after we had him. And two, the newspapers hit a newsprint shortage and the papers shrunk terribly. And comic strips that used to be, oh, maybe this big on the page went down to like this big. And sports cartoons basically went away. They were a luxury that the papers deemed unnecessary anymore. So with those two things happening, I start to skew more into uh, the art as it related to biology. And I determined I was going to become a, a medical uh, textbook illustrator. And I went to college, Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, where I majored in, was started rather, as a biology major with a minor in art because they didn't have an art major anyway. But Another thing changed there. Uh, they did develop a, an art major and biology, it turned out for me, was not quite as dynamic as, as it was when I had that initial high school teacher. So it was full speed ahead with fine art and I graduated as a fine art major, but then hit a blank. What am I going to do with this? A fine art major is, is not a, a ready pathway into a career. So I languished for a couple of years after graduation and did some cartoons for local newspapers back in New Jersey. And then a friend of mine, we got together at a Christmas uh, party in December of 1977, I think it was. And he was an art major as well. And he had gone out to California and gotten into the animation business. And he said, you know, now is the time. Now is the time where they're exploding with new work. And you would be great as a layout artist. So I really didn't know what that was, but I wasn't doing very well in New Jersey. So I said, okay. Uh, this fellow was uh, Norton Virgin, who since went on to be a great uh, director at Klasky Shupo doing um, Rugrats and Wild Thornberries and uh, features of them as well. Uh, so I went out, lived with him for a while, and then... It was onward to try to get into the business. Out of curiosity, how different was the lifestyle from New Jersey to Los Angeles? Well, um, at first, um, the thing that just struck me on going out there was the size of the mountains. I mean, on the East Coast, we have these Appalachians, which are well eroded down. And there in um, California, we had to fly over the uh, 
the Rockies and they were stunning to me, just stunning. And then when I landed and went to live for a while with, with Norton, um, it was an easy transition because he was from Connecticut. So his lifestyle was, had brought a bit of New England with him. So it was, it was a, an easy transition, but I soon discovered there was a lot more, to me at least, a lot more energy and uh, a lot more potential there. So, and then that's when Norton uh, introduced me to his animation boss, Ron Campbell, who had a TV series that he was developing called All in the Castle. Now, the Flintstones were Hanna-Barbera's version of The Honeymooners. And the All in the Castle was going to be Ron Campbell's version of All in the Family, which was a very popular show in the late 70s. And I went in to interview with Ron, and he liked my work, but said, you know, this is going to be a syndicated project, and we don't have enough stations sold yet, but we're anticipating in a few weeks we'll have that. So in the meantime, as a bridge, I'm going to send you across the street to Hanna-Barbera, where I have a friend who's the head of the layout department. So he did that and I went over and started talking with the gentleman and he looked at my portfolio and I knew after about five, 10 seconds that this was going nowhere. He wasn't going to hire me. He started talking about all the people I would be competing with who had been in the business 30 years or more. And they had all the experience that, and I was just a newcomer to it. And I thought, okay, but I'm not going to burn a bridge here and there might be some potential down the line somewhere. So I just listened to him. I said, yes, sir. No, sir. Oh, I agree, sir. And just was very polite. And fortunately, he was a very talkative fellow. As I just nodded and gave a polite response all the time, a gentleman by the name of Bob Singer, who was the head of the model department at Hanna-Barbera, walked in leafed through my portfolio at lightning speed and said, can you start tomorrow? And I said, well, well, yes, yes, I can. <laughs> so I, I left the room with a job and was on cloud nine and was glad that I had played it polite and was there for long enough for Bob to step in and uh, give me a lifeline. So anyway. Did you get to work I, with Bob Singer for a while? Yeah. I did. I did for a bit. Um, the first show that uh, he put me on was something called The Buford Files. And the the main characters had all been designed, but he was looking for people to help with the incidental characters. And I gave it a whirl, and I just didn't cut it. After a couple of weeks, um, Bob was very good encouraging me and working with me. And he knew too, though, that it just wasn't working out. I don't know if it was stylistic or what, but uh, I, I didn't catch on very well. And he said, you know, I'm going to go see if they need some help in layout. Oh, well, that's where I went down in flames a couple of weeks ago. But the guy was willing to take me because they had a huge crunch on a show called uh, Godzilla. And they needed people desperately. And I got put onto that. And... Immediately then, I was afraid, not only was I working with a gentleman who, who really didn't want me in the first place, but Godzilla is a realistic short sort of superhero show almost, and I'm far more cartoony, you know, Huckleberry Hound, Quick Draw McGraw, that sort of stuff. But uh, I gave it my best and stuck it out and was able to work there. And then, incidentally, from there on, I would inter interact with Bob Singer to get models from him for the shows and whatnot. So Bob, Bob was a great fellow, and he still is very, very high on my uh, my list. Yeah, we we got to talk to Bob Singer, and it was oh, amazing. Did you? He's, he's such a wonderful guy. He really is. And he is still, I mean, I'm not a kid anymore, but... Bob is really not a kid anymore, yeah. but he still draws beautifully. And he, he drew this for me. Oh, Recently, that's terrific. He just sent this to me around Christmas. And oh, that's yeah, great. I, he's 95 years old, 95 I think so. and still drawing, and it's just incredible. Amazing. Yeah, he, he has a real gift, and he, he was funny because he was always very um, 
low key and um, uh, dry in talking about things, but he would say things that were terribly funny. And I, I obviously because of what he did for me, I will always hold him in very high regard, but uh, he is amazing to be this talented still this long into his career. Yeah. You said Buford Files was the first show that you worked on for Hanna-Barbera, and yes. you were a model designer. Can you explain to us what a model designer did? Well, uh, the, the after the initial uh, overall main characters were designed, uh, the, the show would start rolling and the writers would write, story editors were edit, and then it would filter its way down to Bob. And Bob would look through it, see what needed to be designed and then pick there were probably about two or three different um designers on each show and he'd pick which uh either a, a character or a prop which would go, be best going to which artist and from that point we would talk talk it over you know what are you looking for in this character or prop or whatever and do you have anything particular you want in mind or should I just run with it and give you some ideas? So we'd, we'd bounce back some things back and forth and then uh, would show the work to Bob and he would critique it and amend it or say, this is good and we'll move forward from that. And then it would go into the um, color department who would tone up um, the different colors as, as we would move on to the next show because it was basically one show a week out right through there. It was, it was lightning fast a lot of the time. It seems like you've tried your hand at almost everything, titles, layouts, and storyboards, uh, and more. Do you have a favorite role in the animation process that you worked? Well, I really enjoyed storyboarding because there you got to shape the whole story, literally, on where the camera was going to be, um, how close the camera was going to be to, to the people, when you were going to cut from one um, scene to another. So it was very, um, very much a hands-on. You got to shape what that show was going to look like. Uh, the producer, of course, then would would make his or her uh, modifications, but you got to really give the rough plan for that show. But what uh, troubled me about it most of all was the immense amount of time that a storyboard took. Uh, like a 12-minute show would take anywhere from 800 to 1,000 panels to do. And you had to do it in a relatively short amount of time. And I don't know if it, I was insecurity on my part or what, but I like to put a lot into the drawings. Some people were able to really get the, the essence of a character or a scene in a few quick lines that worked very well. But I, I tended to not do that. I tended to put more time into it that was necessary. So that was... That was one of my favorite parts, but ultimately I, I really did like layout probably the best because I was allowed at that point to put as much drawing as I could into it. Sure, there were still deadlines and quotas that you had to hit, but they were more within my, my range of uh, ability. And you got to set where the camera was adjusting from the storyboard if you needed to. And place the characters wherever they might work best and uh, give enough room for the animators to have them take a couple, couple step, steps over here and then look out the window or whatever it was. So I, I really enjoyed layout probably the best. Yeah. And sticking with the layout, um, when you were layout supervisor, when you're the supervisor, what all does that role entail? Are you still doing a lot of the actual artwork? Are you doing the creating or are you just kind of overseeing what other people are working on? I think it's it's the latter there that you're overseeing more because uh, again, at, at Hanna-Barbera, that work was coming through so fast. At one point, there was a period of several years where 75% of all the cartoons on Saturday morning were Hanna-Barbera. And that was before they started doing layouts overseas at all. So most of it was coming right through us. And what would happen was um, I would meet with the producers, talk about the show, get their gist on, on what they wanted, and then assign a show, a series, to a crew chief who would then take 
the Smurfs or the or a Scooby show or whatever and and just focus entirely on that show as I was keeping an eye on all of them. And then usually as the shows were done, I would just to keep abreast of what was going on, leaf through the layouts to make sure they were of, of a caliber that we were hoping to do. And unfortunately, the amount of drawing I did greatly decreased. And um, I didn't like that. But uh, every now and then there would be a, a fire that needed to be put out or uh, somebody was, was out and couldn't do it, the work. So I would jump in and, and try to plug the gap there a little bit. But uh, it became more of an administrative thing. And, and dealing with, with uh, Jane Barbera, who was at that point my immediate boss, and Bill Hanna, who was her immediate boss, on making sure that the deadlines were met. And that was a challenge, I assure you. Many times I would go in Monday morning, which was the start of the new week, to Jay Sarbury, the head of the animation department, who was ready to hand out a show that day and hand him a bunch of scenes and say, Jay, we've got some holes in it. We've got to fix these up. I know, I know. Just give me something to start with. So we'd, we'd keep on the treadmill, but sometimes it was a real challenge. Yeah. How did things change when they started moving more towards taking the work overseas. Did that affect you and the jobs that you were doing a lot? Well, it's, it's funny because it, it started with um, the color processing. Um, we, we, Hanna-Barbera was the first studio to bring in computers to do this, this coloring. And they brought in three refrigerator-sized computers that would probably be as powerful as one of our uh, phones today. And we would process the colors on there. And then overseas developed the computers as well as still doing it by hand with a lot of their, their personnel. So that that went overseas and our, our ink and paint department was greatly diminished. And I remember people saying, well, you know, ink and paint went, but they, they can't do the other stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, yes, they can. Oh, if they work hard enough, they will they will develop it. So then all of a sudden, the assistant animation and the uh, in-betweening went over there. Then animation went over there. And we were kind of like the high ground in layout. And there were still people who were denying the fact that it would ever go. And it went. And all of a sudden, a, our department, which was 45, 50 people large, was down to four. And it was stunning. And a lot of people, there were other studios that picked up um, a lot of the talent. So it, it was okay, but no new talent was coming in. And we were whittled down to literally bare bones. And it was, it was tough. It was tough to see that change. And then when later on, when I became producer of the show, I would have to go overseas for a week at a time. And I saw how hard those people worked to learn what they were doing. They had cots at their uh, animation desks where they would sleep at night so they could get up in the middle of the night and work or get up before sunrise and start their day. And they really wanted to do it. And they learned they learned how to do a good job too. So, but it, it was a major transition. And we had, we had a couple of strikes over that situation. One in uh, 79, I think it was. And the, the studios did not expect us to go on strike, I think. And they were caught unawares and they had to cave very quickly. But in 82, they were ready. And basically that broke that broke the whole system and, and everything was going overseas from there on slowly, but it, it went. So. Yeah. You worked as a producer on the land before time, pink Panther, Yogi's treasure hunt and some other shows. How did you get into producing? And do you have a preference between producing a show versus working on the layouts or storyboards? Well, um, I was the head of the, um, Lab department and uh, Gerard Baldwin had been the producer on the Smurfs and he hired um, a, a fellow by the name of Bob Hathcock who was an animator at that point to be his uh, associate producer. So um, 
After a while, Gerard Baldwin left Hanna-Barbera and Bob was promoted to being producer and he needed an associate producer. And he came by and asked me if I would do it. And I said, sure. I had been a layout supervisor for for three years at that point and determined that, you know, this this is a new a new challenge to do this. And and that's where I got to work a lot more with the storyboards. So I thought, let's do it. And um I went over there and uh and developed from that. And at first, um I, I was really enjoying it because I was doing things like timing storyboards to make sure that the length was close enough that we could edit it later on, but not grossly too long or too short, worse. Um, and I got to look at uh, layout keys and uh, character models that were coming in and give my comments on them. So it was great to, to have a little bit of a hand in everything, see the painted backgrounds, which I rarely saw before. And it was very exciting. But then one of the other producers told me, um, in fact, what happened was Bob Hathcock left to go produce Garbage Pail Kids, which was a development by CBS. They were starting their own animation division, and he left to be the first producer there. And a fellow by the name of Don Jerwich came in to take his place. So I was not promoted because the Smurfs was regarded as a jewel and they wanted a really experienced producer to run with it. And I, I don't blame them for that. But what Don told me one point, which I, which I didn't care for too much, was as I was doing some drawings, repairing some storyboards, he said, no, 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 no. You're, you're a producer now. You sh you, you're not supposed to draw anymore. And, oh, oh, well, that's, that's, that's why I got into this. So I, I would sneak on the side doing some of the stuff, but uh, the, the general theme was uh, to, to not draw when you reach that level. And uh, I tr just tried to modify it to something to keep me happy, so. It's good that you were still able to find drawing and-, and fit. Yeah, and it, it, it has stayed with me in all my projects since then. Uh, um, when I first got to do my own series, uh, I, I did a lot more drawing because I had been promoted to the producer, full producer level. So I was able to redefine it a little bit to suit my personal taste a little bit. So You brought up the Smurfs and the first time we talked, you mentioned that you met your wife on the Smurfs. Can you tell us that story? Yes, well, um, the, the overall crew chief of the Smurfs at that point was uh, a wonderful artist and fellow by the name of Floyd Norman, who had spent a, a number of years at Disney and was just a wonderful person, wonderful talent. And he was heading up the, uh, the Smurf crew in, in layout. And uh, he had had someone trying to train my wife in layout and the chemistry there just didn't work out. So he asked if, if I would, would train her on on how to do layout. So we worked together every day for quite a while and um, wonderful student, wonderful talent. She's a great artist. And then it just developed into, into a little bit more than that. And within um, within six months, we, we got engaged. And um, so there, it was nice that there was no feeling of, favoritism later when I got promoted to being last supervisor because she had in the interim during the strike of 82 when everything was shut down she had um, managed to get a job over at uh, Disney in their layout department and she worked on the Black Cauldron and the Great Mouse Detective and uh, then went on to develop uh, projects for uh, WED, the work, which did all of the Disney uh, theme parks and whatnot, and worked on Disneyland Paris and what have you. So it was, she was kind of my little Smurfette and we, uh, we got along very well. And, and, and 42 years later, she's the one setting this thing up for me. So it was <laughs> a great, a great thing for both of us. That's wonderful. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> 
You're credited as a storyboard artist on two episodes of Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue. Yes. The art style for that series was a lot different than the Scooby series before it. Was it more difficult to get used to that style? And what did you think of the style? Uh, it really was, for me personally, a, a difficult transition. I was used to more um, seeing characters in three-quarter style talking to each other as opposed to because the, the rule had been uh, in animation, don't ever have characters profile speaking to each other because the nature of limited animation where you separate the mouth out you have to have three quarters so you can just put the mouth on top of it but if you're like this you've got to animate the whole mouth and head so that's I had gotten so used to the three quarters and this uh, Shaggy and Scooby get a clue um, was patterned more after Japanese filmmaking almost. Uh, a lot of times they would be looking straight at the camera too, uh, which was something we were also told never, never do that. So um, I worked for a uh, producer director over there. I think it was uh, Charles Visser and he was able to shepherd me along a bit uh, and, and correct me where I was doing some things wrong. And eventually I think I got the hang of it, which was kind of good too, because then later on I did some freelance work on a, a series called Beavis and Butthead. And that was very much the same thing. The two guys would be sitting on the couch, either looking directly at you with the TV in the foreground or looking this way again at each other talking. So uh, that, that made that transition a little easier. But uh, to your point, uh, Nikki, it was, it was a hard transition getting used to that. And overall, I still, I still preferred the three quarter, the the classic Scooby Doo stuff from the late sixties, early seventies, as opposed to that particular series. But you know, it was good too. Yeah, yeah. I think we we both also very much prefer the classic Scooby look to any of the more modern ones. But as long as they keep Scooby's character and his integrity intact, sometimes we can overlook the the, the visual cues that they kind of tweak a little bit. There you go. Um, so were you a fan of Scooby-Doo before you came to Hanna-Barbera? Well, I, I really liked the show, but I didn't watch it that much because it, I'm not sure. I think it was 1969 that it came out or thereabouts. And I was 17 at the time and was focusing hard on uh, making the transition from not being a sports cartoonist to how do I get into medical illustration? But I had a sister 11 years younger than I, and she was watching it. And I would periodically on a Saturday morning pop my head in and say, what are you watching? Oh, it's Scooby-Doo. It's great. And I would just sit down and watch a little bit of it. I said, you know what? This is a darn good show. So <laughs> I, I would watch a few shows with her. And that was pretty much my experience before the next year, 1970, I went off uh, to college where I, I, I wasn't able to keep up with it as much. But uh I, I did very much like Scooby. It was a good character, a good group. And, and you how did your the sister... mystery machine? Oh, absolutely no, you can't. How did your sister feel when you started working on Scooby? Uh, she was was very happy about that, and she came out to to visit me in uh, Los Angeles. But this would have been in uh, probably seventy nine, eighty, in there somewhere, and. The, the classic Scooby was was gone at that point, just into reruns and whatnot. But she did enjoy coming by the studio and, and seeing it. And there were plenty of Scooby pictures up on the wall still. So um, she enjoyed that very much and was very proud that her big brother was working on the show. Oh, that's so nice. Do you have a favorite Scooby project that you worked on? Um, well, I can't... I did, I, my favorites were still the older ones, but um, the, uh, my work on the show was kind of sporadic. I was never assigned to it as an entire crew chief or artist on it. So I would just do little bits and pieces of it and, and, and a show if it came along and the, the crew chief wasn't ready to handle it. Um, but I did enjoy, um, and I think this may go against Nikki's grain, but 
I did enjoy one of the shows that I worked on that had Scrappy Doo. I liked I liked Scrappy Doo. He was a good yeah. character. I, I did not care for Scooby Dumb, I think it was, the uh, uh, more rural sort of fellow, but uh, I did very much enjoy uh, Scrappy. So I get out my invisible whiteboard. <laughs> One tick <laughs> under Wendy, no tick <laughs> under Nikki for our Scrappy because we do we do need to. I feel like at this point we ask everyone because we don't necessarily agree on Scrappy and I I adore him. I love him. So, yes, we always need to know what uh, what everybody else's opinion on Scrappy is. And this is a well, I, I felt that he was an OK character because, I mean, Mickey Mouse had his nephews. Donald Duck had his. Popeye had his. So, you know, it's only one instead of three, but why not? So I was okay with Scrappy. <laughs> I'm curious, do you agree? Um, a lot of times Scrappy is credited as sort of saving the franchise from being completely canceled. Do you think if they hadn't transitioned to adding him and doing what they did, do you think that the Scooby franchise would have died out? Like, can we actually say Scrappy kind of saved it? Well, I think there's a good argument for that because any show, when it goes on for too long, uh, if it doesn't have some new blood coming into it, it can it, it can run the risk of going away. And uh, I, I think that Scrappy added a dynamic that that gave some new blood to the to the show, really. And uh, um, yeah, I would say you could say that he saved it. Mm -hmm. Scrappy done it. No, <laughs> that's I'm surprised, you know, this is something that's kind of come up new with all of the different people that we've been speaking with, where I didn't realize that there were people that didn't care for Scooby Dumb. He's not a favorite of mine, but I don't have a problem with him. But I've met a number of people that are like, yeah, I really don't like Scooby Dumb. And I didn't realize that, that that was a thing. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't care for him. I may have just called him Scrappy Dumb. I didn't mean to if I did. But <laughs> yeah, Scoopy Dumb. I, I don't know. I I I felt that where where Scrappy would add some insight into the problem they were trying to solve, uh, I I didn't really get that feeling from uh, Scoop, Scooby Dumb. And um, you know, they had the uh, the Hair Bears and some other characters who. I felt that he was kind of uh, a descendant of, and, and I, I don't know, I just, it, it's an intangible, I can't really put my finger on it, but I, I really didn't care for him. It, it didn't, it didn't add a plus to the show for me. Yeah, you're right. He definitely would have fit in the hair bear kind of genre. That would have been a good place for him. Yeah. <laughs> Send him up there. <laughs> So it's character designer that you're listed as uh, on the Scrappy series. Um, do you recall any character designs that you did for that or any designs in particular from it that you re remember and that you really liked? Uh, frankly, honestly, no. Uh, because I, I know I didn't spend much time on that show. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the stuff was coming through the studio at such a lightning pace that uh, it was here and gone. And it, in fact, to, to give you an example of that too, um, I was going to do some development work for some presentation art for a new series. And Iwo Takamoto was the, was the head of that. And I had to go down to his office once and uh, get instructions on a new show they were developing. And he explained it all to me. And, uh, but uh, we're working on the characters and he was just a genius at character development. But we need we need a background look, and what we're thinking of is something like this. And he pulled out a, a big board with a a, a large a painting of a, a house in town, and I, I'm looking at it, and he says, "You know, do you think you could do this?" And yeah, I did that. <laughs> it was something I had done a couple of years before, and I had never seen the finished piece all painted up. But the longer I looked at it, it just clicked on me. But otherwise, that, that happened, as it did with the, the scrapping model, just so fast that at first you don't remember them. So I'm sorry about that, but. No, that's okay. <laughs> so 
I think that this is a real travesty, but you were the original producer on a pup named Scooby-Doo. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Could you please describe uh, what were your responsibilities as the producer or would have been if you had continued on in that? Did you have creative input? Did you drive the direction of the show? Uh, or was it more just like a business overseeing type thing? Well, the, the um, to, to back up just a little bit from that, the, the very first job I, I got to be the producer on was a 72 minute uh, direct to video and then TV uh, special called The Good, The Bad and Huckleberry Hound. Uh, Clint Eastwood take off with Huckleberry Hound as the sheriff. And I worked with um, a fellow named Tom Ruger on that show. And we worked together very well, I thought. And uh, I enjoyed what he and I think his co-writer was John Luden, what, what they were doing. And because it was a downtime for all producers, Bill Hanna said, okay, producers, you storyboard the entire 72 minutes. So, which I did. And Tom seemed very happy with the way I had done it. And then the show came out well, and Mr. Hannah said, you know, Charlie, I've got a show for you, and I want you to take your first series and run with it. And it's called A Pup Named Scooby-Doo. And Tom Ruger is going to be the story editor. And I said, this is great. We, we worked very well together on the previous one. So, so Tom and I got together and talked it through, and Tom had a real vision for the show. Uh, he wanted it to have almost a uh, Calvin and Hobbes type feel for like whenever Calvin came home from school, Hobbes would just plow him over, running him over as he came in through the door, eyes would pop out and whatnot. And, and Tom said, I'm looking for something like that uh, on this show. And I said, okay, well, let's do that. And we started to develop some ideas and, and work together. And um, at that point I had already scheduled a vacation and I said, you know, we're going to have to take a break here, Tom, and uh, I'll, I'll be back in a week and, and then we'll pick it up. So I went off and when I came back, my assistant said, Mr. Hannah had trying to reach you on your vacation and I, I just wouldn't tell him where you were. I <laughs> said, well, thank you, because this could have ruined my vacation. And what he wanted to talk to me about was that he wanted me to uh, step aside from the show because he wanted to promote uh, Tom Ruger to being the producer because it was his baby. Tom, Tom knew it inside out. And Tom was an artist too before becoming a story editor. So I said, well, okay, okay. I, I can't argue with that. I was really looking forward to doing it uh, and was was quite disappointed. But the next day, Mr. Hannah said, you know what? We've got another series, Popeye and Son. And I loved Popeye. So I said, this is this is fine. I'm sure Tom's going to do a great job on Pup Named Scooby-Doo. And um, one of the storyboard artists we had lined up uh, to, to do some work on it was a fellow by the name of uh, Scott Geralds, who was, uh, uh, you're very familiar with, who is a, an immense talent. I mean, not only as a uh, character designer, but as a storyboard artist too. And he did a lot to, to help the vision of... Uh, of uh, Pup Named Scooby-Doo come through. So so it, it, it that actually worked out okay. I, I mean, I'm not uh, holding um, Popeye and Son up as a shining example of a great uh, Saturday morning show, but it was a lot of fun to work on. And quick aside, um, it was for CBS, and CBS said, you know, this is Popeye. Popeye is not really uh, a regular guy. He's a seafaring old salt, and we, we don't want to lose that. And, oh, by the second or third episode, we had Popeye in the kitchen washing dishes with an apron on. And I said, well, that kind of went away, didn't it? So he was not uh, the mumbling under his breath kind of guy walking down the, the wharves of some remote uh, seaport somewhere. So... But nonetheless, Popeye and Son was a fun, fun show to work on. And I think it was the first one that I got to design the uh, main title for. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, Pop is great, but I, I would have loved to have seen what you would have done 
oh, with okay. that show and how that would have turned out under your under your care and your eye. Um, and Scott Gerald's absolutely loves you. Uh, Scott and I spend a lot of time together and he talks about you all the time yeah. and he has such love for you and only wonderful good memories of the time that you guys worked together on all of well, the different he's, shows. He's, he's a very special guy. I mean, he's not only smart and witty, but uh, as you know, an immense talent and uh, storyboard artist and designer. And in my mind, there is no one on the planet who is better than he at um, drawing the Hanna-Barbera characters, particularly the older ones, or the uh, Charlie Brown and the Peanuts characters. I mean, he draws them dead on and captures the essence of what the characters are. Just a, a very special guy and a special talent. And yes, we had a, many, many very fun lunches together and talking about everything at the time. And uh, he's a great guy, great guy. Speaking of that, if you don't mind, uh -oh. um, Scott asked me, he said, if you get the opportunity, he's like, ask Charlie to tell the story about when we were working on Pink Panther together and we used to go for lunch. And it was something about how a particular way that you liked your yes. pizza, I think. <laughs> yes. We, we were working down there in, in Santa Monica, which is where the studio is. And we would go out to lunch, oh, probably once a week or so. And there was a nice little uh, Italian restaurant nearby. And the waiter would come by, waitress, whichever. And Scott would order just very cleanly. And I would say, um, okay, I want a uh, pizza margarita, but uh, I, I, I don't want any tomato chunks in there. So if you can just sip that out and keep them off to the side. And... I did that every single time. And Scott would be sitting over there just hiding his laughter <laughs> as I'm doing that. And he uh, he then, I can't remember where this happened. It was uh, something where he asked me, if you could tell your current day you some advice for someone who just started out in the business, what would you tell them? And I said to him, honestly, be a lot less picky about your pizza. <laughs> and he, he, he quite enjoyed that. But yes, that was, that was my MO that I was branded as a guy who was picky and didn't want those tomato <laughs> chunks on his pizza. That's wonderful. So you can relay that to Scott and tell him. <laughs> oh, he'll be thrilled that you told that story. <laughs> But Scott is also, he's doing these marvelous um, comic book covers that he just makes up. And they're fantastic. And I think, Scott, more power to you, man. These are, they're just gorgeous. And you're just doing them for fun. And I thought, wow, wish I could do that. But he's, again, immense talent. Good guy. So there are some it's, of it's a mutual always... admiration society. I'm sorry, Nikki. There are some of those comic book covers that I would love to see actual comics turn Absolutely. into a comic. I mean, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Great pairings of characters uh, from mm -hmm. different shows that, that seem very creative. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Scott puts a lot of thought into what things he will or won't pair together. Oh, like I believe that. I believe that. It shows. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, anyway, great guy. So returning to character design for a moment, mm -hmm. how much freedom do you get in that job when it comes to designing them? Are you, is it a fairly blank slate uh, or do the studio, the writers, et cetera, do they give you a lot of specifics? Well, the writers didn't. They would they would give something, uh, um, a, a, a broad description of a character that, uh, oh, Scooby walks into the haunted house and uh, sees a... Uh, a, a craggy old man sitting in a in a um, easy chair, and that would be it. Then that would go to to Bob Singer, and and Bob would uh, then talk to me or whoever was doing the designing, and say what a little bit more what might be looked for for that character, and 
And then you had to read the script too, too to see where it was going to go later, to see if, if there was something specific about his look that was going to be a story point later on. Uh, and then you would go off and maybe do three, four, five different quick sketch versions of what your idea might be to look at. And then Bob would sift through those and say, you know, these I think these are off the mark. I think this one has some potential. So, you know, focus on this one and develop more. And then you would do just that and then go back and, and Bob would tweak it and, and whatnot. And uh, so it was a, a back and forth sort of thing. I At least on the, the little bit that I did on um, uh, Buford Files, uh, but I'm sure there were other there were other people that Bob knew was someone who was dead on, knew the style, knew what they were looking for, and he would just say, "This is I, what I want you to do," and they would go off and do it. Because there were some old guys and old comic book guys, and well, Alex Toth, and then there was young comic book guys like uh, Dave Stevens, who did the Rocketeer, and unfortunately left us far, far, far too early. But those guys knew what the producer and the writers wanted and they could just bang it out. So I, I, I had to have more give and take back and forth. Mm -hmm. Who was it that actually would put the model sheets together? Um, well, there, there would be, um, once, once you got the basic look of the character, then you'd have to do some like action poses, uh, and ultimately very importantly, a turnaround of the character in one position, then see him straight on, three quarters, rear, and three quarter uh, the other way. And then there would be uh, an assistance in the, in the model department who would take those and Xerox them up, paste them up into the formats that were pretty established at that point. And those would go through the whole mill of reper uh, being reproduced on Xerox machines and what have you. But uh, there was there was someone else who would who would take uh, take the drawings and put them into the format that we all recognize. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we do love Scooby Doo, as you can tell from our background. Uh, yeah, I guess that that dog behind you there is one indication. <laughs> I'm seeing some old stuff over here too. So, <laughs> like a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's... What non Scooby Doo projects were you proud of or fond of from your career? Well, pro probably the two that, that stand out most for me are the two that I worked on longest. Uh, Smurfs, I was on them for nine years, and they were just great characters, great characters. And it was a highlight for me when Peo, the, the Belgian artist who created them, uh, came over for a visit through the studio, and, and he got to sit down and talk to me for a while about the characters. I felt very special that he, because I was just a layout artist at that point, and he wanted to take some time to just talk with me about it. And the characters were so lovable. I mean, you, you had each character, basically their name was their personality. Brainy Smurf, Hefty Smurf, uh, uh, all the different Smurfs. Uh, and Jokey Smurf, who some people like to call Terrorist Smurf. But uh, <laughs> they, they were so good that what was nice about them was when you got going on a story, um, there was one particular one, I think it was Sean Derrick who wrote it, about the Smurfominium, where instead of having uh, mushrooms as their houses, they had an old log that they built into almost an apartment complex. And you knew living that close with each other, there was going to be friction. And what was so great was when you had the different characters who personality you knew how they would react in the situation when they did react it was funny and it, it, it gave I'm sure the children who were watching it the ability to anticipate what was coming and still really enjoy it and those nine years were just great years just a fun fun show and then the other one um is definitely Land Before Time I was 12 years on that and did um 10 direct videos and then a series. And it was a little bit the same thing because you knew Sarah, the, the young Triceratops girl, uh, as opposed to Spike, the uh, unspeaking um, Stegosaurus, 
you knew their personalities and you knew how they were going to interact with each other. And when they did, it was funny. And it, it was so, so such an adventure because they, they, there were not current props or anything. Everything was prehistoric and you had to put yourself into that frame of mind and develop the characters and the stories around that. And I, I just love the stories. And John Loy, who was a, a writer and um, story editor at Hanna-Barbera for so many years, then did all of the um, Land Before Times over at Universal. And he was a great, great writer. Uh, in fact, I could remember reading a newspaper over my bowl of Cheerios in the morning and seeing, oh, they've come up with another uh, um, dinosaur bones in, in China. That's cool. And as soon as I got into the studio that morning, I'd get a call from John Lowy. I got dibs on that new thing they found in China. <laughs> so he would write a story about that. But uh, those, those two series were just marvelous, marvelous to work on. And it couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. Yeah. Land Before Time is absolutely one of the most visually stunning, beautiful cartoons that I think has ever been made. Yeah. Um, Thank you. In in and of itself, it was a little traumatic to watch as a kid because there's it's it, there's a little bit of death in it, which I don't think is bad though. I I actually think that we do a disservice to kids if we don't expose them to reality until they're much much older. And I think that doing it through cartoons is a really great way of easing that, you know, because like that is the reality of it. But yeah. well, you know, it, on that front. Uh... Bambi may have been the first one to do that with, yeah, with the absolutely. mom getting shot. You, you never saw it, but you knew what happened. Mm -hmm. And then they did that with Lion King, but much more graphically where mm -hmm. the the little cub comes and nudges the corpse. And uh, I didn't like that. And then in the first theatrical Land Before Time, it was a beautiful, beautiful show. Yeah. But I found it much too dark. I mean, that the, the death element there, and they were constantly in, in peril and, and in danger. And there's very little, there's a, a little bit at one point with Petrie and a couple of his siblings uh, playing around with the berry or something that was humorous. But otherwise, I found that a very dark show. And when we did the um, directed video sequels, we made sure to, to, to skirt that a little bit. Your point being well taken, that it, it, it is something that, that children have to deal with somewhere. But we wanted to keep it more on the lighter side and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and not focus on, on death of parents or grandparents or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Something else I also really love about all those of those Land Before Time ones. I wasn't necessarily a dinosaur kid. Like a lot of kids are really, really into them. I wasn't that person, but they looked so beautiful in that, in those series and in the, the movies and stuff that I was, I did have a general interest in just knowing things about whatever. Mm. And I really like how it seems like everyone that worked on that paid attention to what, what, if those, if real dinosaurs, the different types, what their personalities might be like. Where mm -hmm. you've got, you know, little Petrie, it made sense. Sarah, the way that she acted and the type of dinosaur that she was, even as a kid, I appreciated that you didn't just draw a bunch of cute dinosaurs that just did whatever. It right. made sense for the character to behave the way that that character was, given what kind of a dinosaur it was. And I think that's that's a really special thing in animation. Yeah, well, well, thank you. And one thing that really caught the whole crew by surprise that we were very proud of was there was a um, a find of an adult Triceratops uh, skeleton fossil, uh, almost totally intact. And when the paleontologist re-examined the orientation of the bones and whatnot, they said they they have to rethink the way that they had projected that the Triceratops had walked. And they now are kind of in agreement that it would walk more like this. And they cut to 
Sarah's father walking and the animation. I was like, yeah. holy cow, we're, we're <laughs> up there with the paleontologists at this point. So we were very proud of that back. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Uh, what was the most challenging project that you've worked on? Well, I might have to go back to the 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 first series I worked on in layout, um, Godzilla, because it, it it just was alien to to the way I drew, and I, I tried my hardest to keep um, to learn the new style, uh, but it it was hard. It was very hard. And uh, over the season, um, I, uh, I I got better and better at it, but it was it was real work work but still the atmosphere was so fun around you that it took some of the discomfort if you will out of it that that you're working hard but there's this light feeling everywhere and um then at the end of uh the godzilla run uh uh there was jenna of the jungle and that was the same story uh, they were both doug wildy um projects and he did the original johnny quest back in the 60s and uh, he was very much a, a realistic comic book artist, which the, Dave Stevens, whom I mentioned before, was great to, to work on because he, he knew that style of drawing inside out. So uh, I tried working hard on, on Jenna of the Jungle too, but those were my two most challenging. An interesting story there too, though, was when Jenna of the Jungle was coming down near the end, um, layout, layoff, notices came and the head came around to everybody and said yeah you're on the list you're you're finishing up this friday and whatnot so uh okay you know i've been told that this happens that it, it was a seasonal sort of job at hanna barbera and i still have a couple of little things to finish up on jenna of the jungle so uh i worked and i worked hard that week and i saw other people on the list by 11 o'clock friday morning they were leaving by after lunch there was hardly any of them left and i'm waiting till 5 30 i thought i owe them this i'm gonna work till 5 30 and i'm working on it and then all of a sudden in a panic the head of layout comes through and says where is everybody well they're they're laid off and they left early well can you come in early we got to pick up on on godzilla can you come in monday and start on that show and again why yes yes i can <laughs> So it paid to just ride it out to the end. And uh, uh, some of those people did not come back that left early. So um, it was a challenge, but by putting my heart into the challenge, it paid off again. Yeah. That is also the reason I think people like you, who you loved what you did and you cared about your job. It was something that you, you put your heart and soul into and that is what makes the difference, I think, especially in animation between just a show that you watch for a while and then you forget about it and a show with characters that 50, 60 years later, you remember and you still love it and it made a difference to you when you were little and when you get older. Nikki and I, we still watch Scooby on a regular basis. That's not something we did when we were kids. We still do it. It never stopped and I don't think it ever will stop. And I'm positive that it's people, dedicated people like you, that you infuse a bit of yourself into everything that you work on. And that's what makes it special. And well, so hearing you. you talk about it like this and how you, you did, you were polite and you stayed and you put what you had into it. You did the best that you could in all of these situations. That's why the shows are still, we're still talking about them and why they're so wonderful. And I hope that you know what a difference you have made in so many people's lives. Anyone who has Thank watched you. those cartoons has been affected in a very, very positive way. And most of us, we can't say that we have influenced or inspired anyone or been much of a positive anything on a whole bunch of people but you can say that and for that like thank you from all of us for like making such a great part of our lives even better that's, that's very very kind of you and uh, you know i i when i was a kid i looked up as i mentioned this guy charlie mcgill who did the sports cartoons he was a hero of mine and and i still have 
um, printouts of his drawings from the early 60s that I, I look at very frequently. And there were there were people at the studio that you could tell really wanted to make the show special. There were other people who were a bit jaded and just wanted their paycheck and, you know, would scribble stuff out and, you know, you're not helping us here, buddy. And and it hurt in the long run when, when so much of the work started to go overseas that, that they could do better jobs than you could. So why, why pay so much more for it here? But uh, along with what you were saying, I, I went to see a doctor here, oh, 10 years ago, I guess. And uh, uh, he was asking me, uh, well, what kind of work did you do? And it was a younger guy. And I said, well, I worked in, in animation. And he said, well, what, what were some of the shows? And I said, Land Before Time. I loved those when I was a kid. I said, what? I'm out here. You're my doctor. And you love them as a kid? <laughs> so I all of a sudden started feeling really old. <laughs> but it, it, it's true. There are moments like what you have both have just expressed and what he expressed that something that you've done has touched someone out there and it gives you such a, a great feeling inside to know that you your efforts were were reaching someone so uh, I, I thank you both for, for that it, it means a lot to me to hear that thank you and you have had a really wonderful career and you've done a lot of amazing things was there anything that you didn't get to do that you wish you had well, probably, probably the only thing that I can think of is if I had the opportunity to develop my own show, my own concept. And um, that may still happen. Uh, a friend of mine who has been my, my college mentor for over 50 years now is, is developing a show, and he's asked me to participate in helping develop and whatnot. And I said, you know what? I would love to, as long as I still can move a pencil around, I would love to do that. But to, to have your own concept and characters and and uh, have it come to the screen would be a wonderful thing. And I, and I really haven't done that yet. So, so we'll see. I'll keep you posted. Please do, please do. We definitely want to see anything, anything that you're going to work on. We are definitely interested. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> when I had first sent you the questions when we did the first interview, mm -hmm. I had included the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo as a show that you worked on. And you said that you, even though you're credited on IMDb as being a layout supervisor, you hadn't worked on the show. You said that Hanna-Barbera would put department supervisors' names on the credits of shows that they didn't work on. Why was that done? Um... I, I think they basically they just had a template for all um, credits, and there were certain areas they just changed. Okay, who who were the layout layout artists on this? Okay, let's pull these guys out and put the other guys in or whatever. But um, those those credits were not not that accurate a lot of times because uh, somebody asked me about a show that I worked on. I said well, I never worked on that show, so. Uh, that was just the way they did it. It was very much a departmentalized studio that had a, this is the way we're going to do this. And uh, it's, it's credits were one of those things too. That's just the way they did it. So um, I know uh, every now and then I would have contact with that, uh, the 13 ghosts because uh, uh, I knew Mitch Shower and he was the, the fellow who basically was running that show. Good guy. And uh, and he was seeing it through very, very well. So every now and then, if something came up, I would jump in. But it was very minimal, very minimal. That's interesting. I, I do a lot of history and um, birthdays, death, things like that I post. So I usually go to IMDb for credits and with the credits not exactly being accurate, it makes it a little difficult. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel badly about that, but um, it, it's just the way they did it. And uh, it, it didn't, most of the stuff they've got me down for, I did in fact work on, but 
every now and then there's something like that that just comes up that, oh, okay, well, uh, I suppose, I, I think they always ask for, uh, if you see an error here, you can correct it. And I, I just haven't taken, taken the time to do it, but I should, I suppose. Maybe you'll be my inspiration to do that. <laughs> Come clean. <laughs> Do you have any favorite memories from working at Hanna-Barbera or any fun stories that you can share with us from your career? The general atmosphere being so positive and fun. I mean, we would we would do pranks on each other, nothing dangerous or whatnot, uh, between cubicles or uh, uh, put little gags on their drawings or, or uh, make a fake adjustment to a drawing that they didn't realize that was not done by them. Um, but there was just that general sort of thing. And um, there was also things like there was a, there was one room, one cubicle that had Mike Sikowski, Mike Kawaguchi, Mike Oliva, and Mike O'Mara. So you've got a Polish gentleman, a Japanese fellow, a uh, Irishman and an Italian. And there was a, one, just one phone down at the end of the hall and someone would have an answer and say, hey, Mike, it's for you. And you see these four heads pop up out of the <laughs> cubicle. And it was just, guys, somebody's got to change their name here. You guys are so different. And it was that, that sort of thing uh, just made it funny, you know, and, and, and everybody's just taking it... Uh, serious in terms of it's a job and we have to do it, but uh, um, but being very lighthearted about it all too. And, and even in, in re recording session, we would have, um, we did one thing for Hallmark and the voice people were in the booth ready to record and the voice director, Gordon Hunt, was there with me and he was telling them what their characters are. And he gets to one point and he says, uh, okay, now, Rob, you're going to be fudgy, wudgy, bunny. And then everybody stopped. And Rob goes, Mr. Director, could you say that one more time? <laughs> no, I will not repeat that name. And just silly stuff um, constantly. And uh, Jonathan Winters uh, became... Uh, grandfather smurf at one point and on the very first show that uh, he did with us we we went to a uh, uh, rehearsal uh, room beforehand where i really did a read through and then everybody left to go down to the uh, actual recording booth and jonathan winters had to finish something so i was left uh, with him to shepherd him down so then he says, okay, I'm ready to go. So we're walking down and we come to a, a thermostat on the wall and he just clicks on and he acts like he's in a submarine and he's talking to the guys about the periscope and this and that. And he, he's just going on and on. We've got a recording to do here. And he was <laughs> a whole, a whole shtick just on the, on the thermostat in the wall. So it, those sort of things. And we got admonished for arriving late as well for that. And we found <laughs> out through the course of that season that Jonathan was a tough guy to control when it came to actually recording. But, uh, I mean, just little things like that. And, and stuff like that happened all the time and just made it so much fun. So I'm, I'm very, very, very fortunate to have been able to spend so much time doing that as a career. And... Hopefully we'll still do a little bit more before the game is up. So. Yeah, definitely. Whatever you work on, send to us so that we can check it out because everything that you've done is amazing. I love The Land Before Time. It's so it's such a cute movie. My kids loved it. Yeah. I, you made our childhoods, my kids' childhoods, uh, our adulthoods because we still watch cartoons. <laughs> well, it's funny along those lines. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, Christmas time that came up uh, after I started in uh, early '78, uh, Christmas of '78, I went home, 
and watched one of my all-time favorite Christmas animated specials, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. And I just, from the first time that came on and I saw it at, what, 10 years old or something, I can't recall, I just loved it. And at the end, I'm watching the credits, and there's like four or five guys that I'm working with who are on the credits. And I couldn't wait to go back and tell them how great you did, how that made me feel when I was a, a real youngster. And, you know, their reactions were kind of weird. The kid, you know, don't tell me this. I'm trying to forget I worked on that show. Said, Why do you do that? It's a great show. And it, it was that same feeling of looking up to somebody who had, who had really touched you as a kid. And, and I watch it still today. I, I just love it. it. Stays with you forever. Yeah. Well, we love your contributions to animation. And thank you thank so, you. so much for your time. It's I, been a blast, even doing it a second time. If you want to screw up something here so we can do it a third time, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm going to try not to, but you yeah, are no, no, welcome I, 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 to come and join us on the panel. And talk yeah, you just come whatever. back anyway. We don't need to yeah. make a mess. We okay. can just, you just come on whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I hope it does work out for you well and that uh, you can get a good show out of it there. Yeah, definitely. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you so much for everything. We do really appreciate it and we appreciate you. And um, just please go away knowing that you're very, very loved and that you have made a very positive impact on this world and you will continue to well well into the future because thank god for technology i mean there are some things about it that are a little iffy but the good thing is that we can still watch all of those cartoons whenever we want and share them with the next generation too that's right and yeah. just make sure that it, it never dies and that all of the work that you guys put in will continue to make a difference to people and we love you and thank you so much for that very sweet. Very sweet of both of you. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for just having me on here with you. It was great fun. Yeah. Thank you. It's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just had four little things I wanted to mention. Three of which I think I mentioned the first time we did this that I neglected to <laughs> touch on the second time we did this. So... When I was transferred from models into layout, I was moved into a cubicle with a very nice gentleman by the name of Ray Jacobs. And he was very kind to me. He taught me a good deal about drawing and the mechanics of doing layout. And he had a friend by the name of Dave Tendler who would come by every day and the two of them would walk during break time. And what was so interesting about these two gentlemen was they were both elderly and Ray started at Disney in the 30s and worked on Snow White, the first theatrical feature film. And Dave started at Max Fleischer Studios in the early 30s and worked on the original Popeye shorts. So these are two guys who started at really the beginning of the great American animation. And what I thought afterwards was rather cool was that I was 25 years old at the time, and here I was in contact with these pioneers from this great industry of animation. And I and the two or three other people of about my age who started at the same time were going to be the last generation that would be able to have contact with, with these people. So it was great to spend time in a room with Ray and have Dave come by and just soak up some of the stories and whatnot that uh, that they had to offer. And it was really, really cool. So that's um, really great. Part one. On to part two. <laughs> um, about a year into my time in the layout department, two things happened that really turned things around for me. I was working on Godzilla and Jenna of the Jungle, both of which were really testing my drawing abilities because it was not the natural style in which I drew. So the, the two things that happened first was those two shows came to an end. And I was then put on to a show called Richie Rich, which was a adapted version of the comic books. And in that time, the second thing that happened 
was that we got a new supervisor in the layout department by the name of Don Morgan. And he was an incredibly talented man. He, along with Oscar Defoe, laid out the entire uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas TV special from the early 60s. And he also ghosted the Pogo comic strip when Walt Kelly, the creator, uh, got lethally ill finally and, and, and couldn't do it anymore. And what Don did when he came in was he looked at the portfolios and the scenes that were being done by the newcomers. And he took a personal interest in me. And I felt very, very pleased at that. And he would make it a point to look at all of the scenes I turned in and then get me into his office and critique them, tell him what I had done, tell me what I had done right and where I could have done a little better and where I was just way off base. So he really, really mentored me. And that the, that combined with being on a new show of Richie Rich, which was far closer to my natural drawing style, really helped propel me on a great road to develop uh, in the layout department. Part two. <laughs> Before you go on, I just want to say that it's really awesome that you got to work with these veteran animators. And I imagine that they had some amazing stories from, you know, the 30s. And Well, I'll, I'll tell that? you just one that Ray told me. He said his most exciting moment in his entire uh, animation career was um, back in the early days, Disney, when they were doing pencil tests to see how the animation was working, they would shoot it they wouldn't make a print, they would just project the negative. So you would have a black background with these white lines that were the pencil lines. And they were going to have a screening of a pencil test from Pinocchio. So Ray went into the auditorium and all of a sudden coming and sitting next to him is a guy by the name of Walt Disney. So the pencil test they're looking at is a sequence with Monstro the Whale, where he's just jumping out, breaching out of the ocean and going back down in. And Ray was just blown away by it, how powerful that sequence was. And he just took a little glance over at Walt. And Walt wasn't doing much, but he just had a big smile on his face. And Ray said that was the best moment he'd ever had in animation. So he had a bunch of other stories, but that was the one that really sticks with me. So. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> it was really nice to work with guys like that. So to what you guys are interested in, Scooby-Doo. Um, I, I mentioned before that uh, uh, I didn't see much of Scooby at the beginning because I was getting ready to go to college, but I had a sister 11 years younger than I, and she watched this new show called Scooby-Doo. So I sat in a couple times, saw it, and I thought, this is a pretty darn good show. And it was entertaining, but what I also found was that it was very almost therapeutic because it took something that for children, the idea of monsters or ghosts uh, that would make them very afraid and it made it funny. And so the kids could laugh at their fears. Uh, when I was a kid, a movie called Hold That Ghost by Abbott and Costello did the exact same thing where they went to a house that was supposedly haunted. And in the end, they found out that it was a, an evil real estate agent or somebody who was trying to scare people away from the house. So it did the same thing for me because I was frightened of the concept of ghosts and my sister was too. And then years later, um, in the mid eighties, a movie called Ghostbusters came out. And although the ghosts were real there, they were very silly ghosts. And it allowed kids from that generation to again, laugh at things that were very scary. So. I, I look back and I think Scooby, a, a great show anyway, but it did something even beyond that that I think it should get more credit for. We have yeah. talked about the life lessons of Scooby-Doo and the things that we've learned from watching the series. So that's that's a really good point that you bring up. And, you know, when when the kids would see Scooby and Shaggy just reacting so crazily and going berserk, I mean, I think they could really relate to, hey, you guys are going more berserk than we would in that situation. So they could really relate to them. And uh, anyway, it was it was a real plus to the show that I don't think gets enough credit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. 
And the last thing I had wanted to say was back to the subject of scrappy. <laughs> we have a plus smile down here and we have, <laughs> oh no, not scrappy. <laughs> Um, I, I did like Scrappy very much as a character. I, I found him enjoyable. But the one thing that was very difficult with him was when you'd get a script and it would say something like, Scrappy walks along, finds a boulder or a gravestone or something, and lifts it over his head and carries it off screen. But when you look at Scrappy's design, his little arms don't come up over his head anywhere near it. So it always presented a bit of a challenge to us doing the layouts of it to, to make it somehow work. And um, we did somehow, and the rest is history, I suppose. But... <laughs> you're forgetting the best part. Uh -oh. Mickey! <laughs> that your wife does not like Scrappy. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, she's, she's just down the hall right now. And when I mentioned Scrappy to... Uh, <laughs> to her, she said, oh, I couldn't stand Scrappy. But it's okay. it's okay. Wendy, you and I are on the same page there. That's so. right. We <laughs> love you, Scrappy. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, when you look back, um, it, it didn't, the original run of Scooby wasn't all that long. I mean, it wasn't like Smurfs doing eight or nine years or something, but they are classics. And Great show, great show, and, and and obviously because it lives on in different guises even today. So, yeah. be it live action movies or whatever. Sure. So, yeah, yeah. And I think it's cool that what you guys are doing with uh, with Scooby. Thank you. We love Scooby, so yeah. yeah Anything we can that. do that's Scooby related makes us happy, and that's what life's about, <laughs> right? Being happy. So, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. So, and. Uh, you know, we had some of the uh, uh, voice characters from uh, uh, Scooby who worked on other shows with us as incidentals on uh, Smurfs or uh, Richie Rich or whatever. And we'd always have to say, you know, hey, give us a little scrap here. Give us a little shit here. <laughs> and it was always very funny to hear him do it. So great show. I'm, and I'm, again, I'm glad you guys are doing what you're doing. Yeah, Scooby, Scooby definitely sort of stands out, I think, from all of the others. And it's interesting, too, that it has lasted this long. But I'm not sure that people or that everyone realizes that. I honestly think that if any of the newer iterations of Scooby had been the very first, I don't think that 50 years later, Scooby would still be a thing. I think that Probably it was the right formula... There. And the way that it was put together, the way they presented it, the way that the characters were generic, not boring, but they were generic. So everyone could relate to each of them in some way, shape or form because they were just, it's just this character. And we didn't have a lot of like interpersonal drama or anything that didn't right. exist in classic Scooby. It was just like good versus evil and good wins. That's right. And I really think that the only reason that people can kind of monkey with that now and try to make it something, oh, well, let's make it darker or let's make it more edgy. And those iterations, I think, are going to be very forgettable in the future. And I don't think that if they had been where Scooby started, that Scooby would have lasted the way that he did. That, that classic Scooby needed to be cemented back then in order for us to still be loving it now, in spite of what people have been doing to him. At least that's, I, I, I think, think that's... you're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I can't picture like the live action movies being done in the late sixties and then still living on as a classic yeah. 40 years later or whatever. So mm -hmm. uh, no, I think you're dead on the money there. Yeah. And you guys are helping keep that going. We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> You brought up the Smurfs, and before you go, you sent me a picture of you and Al Gamir, and you were holding the Emmy that was mm -hmm. the Studio One. Can you tell us about that? Um, the the producer on that show was Gerard Baldwin, and he was the first producer I worked under who had a real hands-on approach. I mean, he would come over to the layout department and and look at what we were doing, and uh, make comments on some of the storyboards and how he'd like to see them be done differently. And he 
he really made himself available to us. And that, I think, fired us all up to do an even better job. Plus, we had visits from uh, Peo and his uh, uh, translator gentleman, and that fired us up too. And it was just a, a fun, fun show to work on because you had all these 15, 20 different characters with another one seemingly added every year or two that were very, very specific on what their personalities were, brainy or hefty. Um, and it came to the point where it was very entertaining for the kids to see a character in a predicament and know exactly how they were gonna react. And that made it funny because they could anticipate stuff. And I think I may have mentioned before, there was one great show called the, the uh, Smurf Aminium uh, by Sean Derrick, I think wrote that one. And they had a, instead of living in mushrooms, they decided they would live in what we would call a condominium complex, which was an old hollowed out tree. And you can imagine all of a sudden these characters are not living alone in their houses. They're thrust next to each other and you know there's gonna be friction. And it was great. Sean did a great job writing and anticipating what their different personalities would do. And it was a very, very funny show. One of the best, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think there's maybe something about, I mean, can we call it predictability? in Hanna-Barbera cartoons like Scooby and the Smurfs where you don't know like this every story is beautifully written and unique and I really don't think that anyone could solve a Scooby mystery the first time that they watch it whether they're six or they're 60. I don't buy that. I I thought that those were written very well to where no, you I agree. Uh, if you go uh, once you know and then you go back and you look at all the clues that they put in you'd be like oh how did I not see that but I don't believe anybody that says oh I could have figured that out the first time I saw it no I, I don't think you could especially for younger children and considering what you said earlier about how it could actually help them face their fears just by seeing Scooby and Shaggy and the gang coming into contact with things that are inherently scary and showing that like you don't have to be that scared about it um oh my gosh I'm sorry my mind just went completely <laughs> blank <laughs> completely thankfully that hasn't happened in quite a few panels but uh, mm -hmm. it has wait, wait till you get to my age it'll go blank <laughs> a lot more often <laughs> well you know it's it's oh. funny you say, bring that up because um when my wife and i watch uh tv mysteries or detective things or whatever on on television we will wonder how it's all going to come out and then at the end We'll then think back, oh, well, that was set up here and there. And then it's very fulfilling because it all meshes believably. So, and that's, that's what you're talking about with the Scooby. Yeah, no, absolutely. True. Yeah. Um, but yes, with, with things like Scooby, where you know the formula, you know, there's going to be a mystery of some sort. They're going to have to work together to solve it. In the end, they're going to figure it out and they're going to help somebody. And I think that especially for younger children, but also as an adult that has to, you know, live in a stressful world with anxieties and things like that, there's something really comforting about sitting down to watch something and you don't know the specifics of what's going to happen, but you still have an idea of how it's going to play out. And you know that you're going to get that like happy, satisfied ending. And so you can sit and enjoy it without any anxiety you know, there's yeah. anticipation because you don't know the specifics of the story, but there's no anxiety involved in that. And I think that that is the hallmark of good entertainment. And I think we've forgotten that in modern times. Actually, that what's funny about what you say there is almost word for word what my wife says about some of the things that, that we watch. And lately we've been watching uh, a bunch of these um K-dramas or K-rom-coms, things mm -hmm. from uh, Korea, like 16 episodes worth. And at the end, you may have been taken through some anxiety along the way, but everybody works out believably in the way it should, and you feel very satisfied. So yeah. uh, we know exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, it's uh, It's been a hoot for me, uh, just a lot of fun to get. And it's really made me reflect on some of those early days, like I hadn't thought of 
Ray Jacobs in those first days in layout and so long. And it just gave me a great feeling to think back on him. And um, I don't know, it just, it just was a, a good, good walk down memory lane, I guess. So okay. thank you. That's okay. good. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much again for taking the time and coming to talk to us because we love talking to you and yeah. hearing your stories and everything. And it's just, it's been a real treat, really. Oh, good. And and I appreciate your patience in having to do this a couple of times over. But uh, <laughs> anytime you want to come and talk to us, we're we're here. We're I've been to watch it because I might take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. This is great. I, I can't believe how much fun this has been to work with you guys. So Oh, uh, that's great. Thank that's you. that's like the best compliment ever that you had a nice time. That's oh, the best. I absolutely did. And if if I had more interesting things to say i'd say well let's do a part two too just, uh, <laughs> i'm to sure you'll, you guys again. Stuff. you'll come up with new stories and you'll be like oh i gotta talk about that absolutely i gotta talk absolutely. about this person and yeah well, some of them are not repeatable on the air but uh, <laughs> uh there were a lot of you know the, the thing is it's it's an industry and a job that that has deadlines and budgets and all that but still it's so darn silly you get to have fun drawing funny pictures and posing characters to to augment what they're saying to emphasize the, the humor of it all. And it's just it's just great. I can't can't think of anything else that would have been better. Yeah. Yeah. And something that so many people get to enjoy. Yeah, like, that's a, millions of people. And it's not a, over. It will continue. Millions yeah. more. Well they'll they'll keep doing uh, Scooby as long as you guys keep pushing it. <laughs> hopefully they do it a little bit better than the last series that was put out yeah yeah i wasn't i wasn't that that fond of that one but no. you know it is it is what it is so. we all just need to play the lottery yeah. and then when we all collectively win our own lotteries we pool the money we buy warner brothers out and we resurrect hanna barbera and that's <laughs> that's the dream works that's for me dream. i'll keep a bag packed <laughs> Oh boy. Oh, God. What's funny is we would actually do this if we yeah, wanted we would do it. <laughs> yeah, we would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that, that Warner's owns it all. And it was near the end of my stay there, things were changing so fast in terms of who owned it. I remember when we were working on a project and Ted Turner had had uh, basically bought the studio and uh, he wanted a tour through what we were doing. And, and Carol, my wife, gave him that and explained a bunch of stuff to him. And then, uh, well, Taft had, from Ohio had bought it out before then. And then Warner Brothers. And I don't know, it just was spinning so fast. And uh, I felt a little little bad about it. I always felt that yeah. Hanna-Barbera should be Hanna-Barbera. I mean, that was, yeah. that yeah. was what it was. But, uh, yeah. you know, things change. All right. Well, thank you so much for. Oh, and thank you guys so much for another hour. This is great. Yeah, yeah it, it was really. And nice. I will try my darndest to get you something tomorrow. I'm just okay. going to tear through everything we got left and get you something. I promise. All right. Okay, guys. Thanks, Have a good evening. You too. Good night. Bye. <laughs> thank you for tuning in to another Scooby panel. I'm Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com. If you like these panels, please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions. A huge shout out to our patrons, Julie Rosen, Ross from ScoobyFan.net, Tagus, Elizabeth Maloney, and Mindy. If you would like to support the Scooby panel, please go to patreon.com slash scoobyaddicts. A very special thank you to storyboard artist, layout artist, producer, and director Charles Grovner, artist, blogger, and Scooby collector Wendy Bridge, and Will Davenport who supplied some of the questions we asked. Scooby Panel is available in podcast form on most podcast platforms or as a web series on YouTube. You can find Scooby Panel on Instagram, Facebook, and X as at Scooby Panel. Scooby and Shaggy were voiced by Scott Innes. Check out Scott's website, onescottshop.com. Scooby Addict's artwork by Will Davenport. Video editing by Nikki Blake. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for another Scooby panel.